So, um, as everyone knows, we're here today to talk about Shonda and some of her shows. So I'm just going to give a quick little introduction about Shonda um, and then introduce our speakers here and then we'll get going. So Shonda Rhimes is a black screenwriter and producer, originally from Chicago, Illinois. She's better known, however, as the mastermind behind Grey's Anatomy, Scandal, and How to Get Away with Murder, three incredibly successful shows that have enjoyed lengthy runs on primetime television. Before settling on TV, Rhymes bo wrote both Crossroads, Britney Spears' debut movie, and The Princess Diaries in the early 2000s. She's been the executive producer and showrunner of the medical drama Grey's Anatomy since its debut in 2005, which is still airing on ABC after 12 successful seasons. In 2011, Rhymes' pilot script of Scandal was picked up by ABC and is now in its fifth season. Three years later, the world was introduced to Shondaland's latest concoction, How to Get Away with Murder. These three shows, together, in their prime, have garnered over 40 million viewers per episode. Since 2014, when Thursday nights on ABC started to play back-to-back -back Shondaland shows, all three shows combined have given ABC its best viewership on Thursday nights in five years. Shonda Rhimes has been both praised and criticized for her self-proclaimed colorblind casting approach. This means that the characters have been written and are cast with no specific race in mind, leaving each role to be filled by an actor of any ethnicity. Indeed, when casting for Grey's Anatomy, Rhymes admits that she imagined the racial makeup of the cast quite differently than how it turned out. However, critics have remarked that her shows are a haven for racial diversity. How does this practice affect the viewership and impact of Shonda's shows? Our three speakers will be discussing this and many other themes over the course of the next hour. So first, Dr. Kristen Warner is an ass assistant professor in telecommunication and film at the University of Alabama. Her focus is on racial representation and its place within the media industries particularly in casting. She's the author of The Cultural Politics of Colorblind TV Casting, and her work can be found in publications such as Television and New Media and Camera Obscura. Dr. Van B. Higgins is an Associate Professor of Film and Media Studies at Arizona State University. Her research centers on comedy and issues of representation. She authored the award-winning Laughing Mad, The Black Comic Persona, and Postal America, was a screenwriter for Why We Laugh, Funny Women, and consultant on Whoopi Goldberg Presents Mom's Make Me. Her current project deals with blackness and comedy in the age of Obama. Dr. Monica White Ndunu is an associate professor at Tufts University Department of Drama and Dance. Her written and performance works consider race, culture, and economics in African American performance art. She is currently working on a multimedia project exploring African American acting theories and practices, and recently published the award winning Shaping the Future of African American Film color-coded economics, and the story behind the numbers. So with that, I'll leave it up to Vishnu and he gets started. First off, welcome to our guest speakers. Um, I'm extremely excited to have you all here tonight to talk about many people's favorite Shonda Rhimes. Um, before we dive into specific questions, we will have the speakers present their opening statements on their perspective on Shonda's colorblind approach what it means, what they think it means, and the important or lack of importance it holds in Shonda's success. So if you'd like to do some or start talking. I'm sure. Um, so first, thank you all for coming. It's such a pleasure to come out here um, and talk about one of my favorite topics. Although I don't know if everybody will like how I talk about it. Uh, we'll see. Uh, so um, I have watched um, Shonda Rhimes' success since she started uh, with Grey's Anatomy in 2005. And even though that wasn't a show that I necessarily wanted to watch, uh, my best friend was, uh, she didn't have a television, and so she'd come over to my house and watch this show on Sunday nights, and so I sort of got hooked by extension, by proxy. But one of the things I immediately began to notice about the show was first that it was very visually diverse, that you know you had black doctors and Asian doctors, 
you know, doctors. Like you had a whole set of folks. So that was really interesting to see um, on broadcast television. But then the second thing was I noticed that even though there was all this visual diversity, sometimes in the storyline, like there were things that maybe just didn't match up or there was something that just wasn't quite right. And one of the, one of the episodes that I noticed was, I think it was the season one, and it was an episode called Into You Like a Train, where <clears throat> the, there's a train accident and there's this black man and this white uh, woman who are impaled on, on this train, this rod. And so the question of the show becomes, who's going to get saved, right? Like this is the, this is the premise of this episode. And it's interesting because at no point in the entire episode is it ever addressed that she's a white woman or he's a black man, an older black man. And so it just became like, well, she's, he's old and she's young, so maybe he should lie and she should live so she has much more life to give. And, you know, like this back and forth conversation about everything except for the fact that there's a history here, right? Like there's a black man, an older black man, and a young white woman. And this historical sort of con construct of putting these two types these, with, these, with these experiences, these historical experiences on, on a whole together and never really talking about it struck me and made me wonder what was happening. And so then I began to sort of do some research and that eventually became my dissertation on how this happened because ultimately what it resulted in was a case of colorblindness where she didn't, you know, as she did with her show, wasn't really interested or wasn't going to acknowledge how race is implicated here. So it could have been anyone. According to Shonda. And so, you know, what we'll be talking about for me today is essentially how that happens and why that's meaningful. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Lindsay. Hi, everyone. Well, I wasn't one of the people who were on the original train. And uh, what made me start watching it was, I think when they moved it to Thursday nights and it became like a really big deal. Because at that time, I think, see, I think I was in grad school too, so I had a lot of work to do. Um, and also because I'm in theater, very often we have rehearsals at the times that they would have um, those shows on. Uh, so I started watching the show, and again, I was taken with the fact that you have this range of people in the cast, and also looking at their backstories. Um, for instance, Christina Yang, who um, is Korean American or um, Canadian, actor, I believe, actually, and her backstory though she's also Jewish in the storyline. And so you would see these interesting twists in terms of the character backgrounds that I found fascinating. Also the character of Bailey, who was originally supposed to be, I think they were calling her um, the Nazi. And so originally she was supposed to be played by, I think they wanted a white Jewish actress to play uh, Bailey and they end up casting a black woman. So just having those sort of things happen, it's, I was curious as to whether or not this was a deliberate choice on the part of the creator of the show, um, or if it was something that just happened in the process of developing the characters. And so in the theater, one of the things that we really um, have started to talk more about is this issue of colorblind versus color conscious casting. We live in the United States of America, which has a very history, I don't think colorblindness is possible. And uh, Sh Shonda writing in this way, I think it opens the door for interesting uh, narratives to take place, but at the same time, ignoring some of those histories, I think you can end up reinforcing things that, um, that actually you could deal with creatively if one takes the time to do it. So I think that's part of one of the things I would want to Shonda Land train pretty early, and I have um, I have ridden through many a stop in mm. private practice, <laughs> which took some effort. And um, <laughs> I got off at the catch, though. It, yeah, it just isn't 
working for me. When you can't watch more than 20 minutes with Peter Kraus on the screen, something's wrong. Um, but one of the things that, and this sort of hits on upon both what both um, Kristen and Monica have said, is the idea of Shonda Land productions, whether it's the shows for which she is the showrunner, or a show like How to Get Away with Murder, where Peter Nowak is the showrunner and she is one of the executive producers who occasionally writes for them. Um, in each of these shows, we have this, um, this sort of dance around race. Um, I remember specifically the episode you're talking about, and and I also think of, and I think you give this example, Kristen, in your book about the because they're so conscious, so conscious about not putting like foregrounding blackness, and yet there's a specific episode where Preston Burke, played by Isaiah Washington, um, has been hurt, he's had surgery, and his parents come to visit uh, Washington. Um, Preston Burke was with Christina Yang, um, Sandra O's oh character. And his mother and father are played by Julia, um, well, by Diane Carroll, who's famous for playing Julia on, on television, was the first uh, black woman to, to be nominated for an Emmy. Um, and her father is played, his father is played by Richard Roundtree, who was Shaq. Now, when you get the super Negro and the super bad together, there are a lot of narratives that are being brought into, into this show. And yet, we're supposed to kind of think about it in, in a, a colorblind way, in an incidental way. Um, and one of the, the other things that comes to my mind is the difference between the latter two shows in terms of actually having black female protagonists. Bailey is an interesting character, but Bailey is a supporting character. But with both, um, with both Olivia and Annalise, you have a different construction of, um, of a protagonist, which I would argue is very much tied to ideas of, of moral ambiguity that are a part of quality television today. And I think that moral ambiguity is interesting and problematic particularly when looking at the history of representations of black women on television. And I'd like to deal with that more over the course of the day. And thank you for inviting me. <laughs> um, so now we'll go uh, forward with asking specific questions. Um, so the first uh, question is directed towards Dr. Warner, um, but each of our other uh, guest speakers will also talk about them. Um, so what are the differences between colorblind and color conscious casting and how do they relate to the ideas in the audience and the industry about diversity, inclusion, and tolerance? And thus, how do the notions of colorblind casting play, play into rhetoric about the existence of a post-racial America? Should this be a concern for audiences or why is this a concern? Okay. I got three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> emerges from theater, right, um, where you have, you know, in the 1950s, there's this man named Joseph Papp who wants to, who wants to, you know, diversify um, his Shakespeare uh, productions. And he realizes that as of, at, as, at that point, that there weren't enough actors of color who were being able to, who were able to be employed. So he does a sort of casting, so he invites like James Earl Jones and Ozzy Davis and Ruby Dee to all sort of join in and, and partake in these experiences and not just play Othello, right? So color by casting has a long history. And so when, and so the idea of it is around employment, right? The basic idea of how colorblindness, colorblind casting emerges is as a, a, a protective state for legally protected classes, right? So it's a rate, so it's how do we get people who would not be seen on television or in film, how do we actually make them, get them work? So colorblind casting allows for that because you're not writing race into the script. So on, in theory, it's a really great idea because it does get people into the room. And if you are talking about cat at the level of casting where you know casting directors are for television especially are working on limited schedules, it becomes a very useful tool when you know that they're going to, otherwise they would just sort of pick from the same pool that they've been using. So colorblind casting becomes a way 
to open up the pool and invite people who you wouldn't necessarily invite mm -hmm. for those to, to audition for those parts. Now, the problem is that when you are writing for these parts, you're not writing right into the script, but because you know the data suggests on writers' rooms that most writers are white men, and that writers write what they know and they write who they know, most of the time they're writing for people who look like them. So you're not, so you're writing what we call normative roles, which are, you know, roles for white people, right? So you're not adjusting for the part. This becomes the problem with colorblindness, where the person who takes the role may be of color, but you don't adjust or acclimate or, or you know, or adjust the part or the, the script to that person who you're picking. And so what ends up happening is you end up with um, this pitfall where if you don't account for, where, for who this person is or what their backgrounds are, then you may very well end up right, walking into a stereotype or a trope. So for example, with Chandra Bailey, who plays, uh, Chandra Wilson, who plays nurse, uh, Dr. Bailey on Grey's Anatomy, right? If she took the role, who was initially for a white, a white, uh, a white lady, blonde hair, blue eyed woman, um, she takes the part and nothing is adjusted for that part, then in that instance, all the things about her that if, were a white woman playing it, you may not think anything about, become very, very particular when she takes it. So for example, everybody else is having sex except Dr. Bailey. Dr. Bailey is always in her scrubs. Dr. Bailey is always at the hospital and we don't really see her in a relationship. My mind, I quit after season four, I know she gets married, I know all these things happen, change. <laughs> but up to season four, she had, like she was married but we never saw her husband until he came in sick. And so she is sort of, and she's reduced to taking care of the, the resident, so she becomes this very hyperactive mammy. Not on purpose, but because that's what happens when you don't adjust for the part. And so this is why color conscious casting becomes so crucial. Because if you're writing for a person, you open the part to whomever, a person takes it and then you specify in, and account for the difference in the backgrounds of those people, then you may end up in a very sort of sophisticated and complex um, character. And so that's crucial crucial to, to what makes this distinction so necessary. <laughs> I think, um, well said. Thank you, um, two minutes and 30 seconds. <laughs> so I think the thing I would add to that is, um, and considering this is uh, pretty much what, what Kristen said is focused on the writing of that character. So let's think about this. You have actors of color who do not have the star power to be able to manipulate that script and to make those adjustments. Um, and so then you have to think about how the entire system works to kind of maintain the same types of characters that are reinforced. So actors of color, and especially women, are less likely to have that kind of star power to be able to have those adjustments made to the script, which is why it's really important that you have someone like Shonda Rhimes who actually, okay, she's, uh, she's complicated. <laughs> because in some ways what she does is very progressive and in other ways it does kind of um, reinforce certain things. I have a theory about why I think she's doing it, which I'm sure we'll get to when it's time for my question. Um, but I do think that having someone in a position of power when you have a script that is rigid in that way is really important. Um, if that person recognizes what those pitfalls are. Very often you'll find that actors are trying to make those adjustments within their performances. Um, I would say within Grey's Anatomy, Isaiah Washington, I feel, used to do that all the time. He presented himself as a black man, a very particular black man in the way that he carried himself within that role, even though it wasn't necessarily specified that he had to be a black man. So. Um, <coughs> I, that's just the other part of it that I think we should also consider as we're going forward, the role that the actors play in trying to flesh out those black characters. Thank you. And Dr. Henry? Okay. <laughs> what they said. Um, <laughs> no, the one thing I would add, and it has to do with both performance and with writing, uh, because the case that, that I think makes this so clearly um, it has to do with how to get away with murder. And the really famous scene where um, Viola Davis's character, Elise Keating, uh, is taking off her makeup. She's uh, get, getting ready to have some kind of front confrontation with her husband. 
and in frustration, she's taking off her wig. Now, taking off the wig is this, it, it, it's an incredible moment because it, it shows a degree of vulnerability. And also, I would argue, is, is coding her in a specific way and, and a, a sort of acknowledgement of blackness without overtly saying, this is a black thing. Um, and, and that, we know, was Viola Davis's decision. It wasn't in the script. And so that goes along with what you're saying about how actors having, actors having the cachet to try those things, to stretch, um, can make a huge, huge difference in, in terms of how audiences are able to, are able to receive them. And I, I, would, I think as, as we get characters, and I think two, two of uh, Shonda's Black, two of the characters within the Chandelier universe, um, Annalise and Olivia, both show some really interesting things, um, particularly in the fact that they aren't idealized, particularly in the fact that they have, they have a great deal of agency, but they also have a great deal of baggage. And that's a kind of nuance we haven't necessarily seen on television. Um, so as I watch Shonda's shows, I see there is a discrepancy between how quickly Shonda develops main characters in her newer shows like Scandal versus her older shows like Grey's. Um, and this is like her main, how she develops her main characters. Um, so as a fan, this first some questions. Uh, so what may be the motives or intentions behind the way she develops characters, specifically minority characters? And how does the history of black representation on television still impact the progressiveness of folks of color, particularly black women in the Shonda Land. Yeah, that's another thing. Um, <laughs> I would say, in terms of her motives and intentions, I don't, um, I don't completely know what's driving her, but I'm gonna guess at um, why some of the characters and, uh, or newer characters in the older shows and maybe even some of the characters in the newer shows may be developed I think in many ways, um, and you find this with a lot of people who sort of break that barrier and they become stars in their own right with the work that they produce, she has license now to be able to do a lot of things that she probably wouldn't have been able to do originally. Um, my theory was originally, and, and um, Krista may have other, other, uh, another side to this that she may want to talk about, but I originally thought that Shonda was playing this game where she's like really much more conscious than she's letting on and that she structured her shows in a way that would make it look as though she's playing the same game that's been played in Hollywood in terms of casting. So um, again, going back to Grey's Anatomy, we have Ellen Pompeo, who's the primary character, and uh, you know, the various castmates. And most of these characters of color are people who were surrounding her. They're important because of whatever their relationship is to Meredith. So it seemed to be structured in a way where she was um, using what I call in my work the white point of entry, which is a white character that uh, white audiences tend to be able to identify with. It. And then surrounding that character with people of color that might draw in, you know, um, I feel that some of the characters that she's presented um, recently, some of them are speaking up more on some of those issues that were lacking in the earlier seasons. Um, for example, when the scandal first started, there was this uh, Thomas Jefferson, Sally Hemings history that nobody seemed to be talking about. And it's not until later, you know, several seasons later when Joe Morton, you know, starts to bring it up. I, I think Olivia mentions it once, but kind of in passing. And then it's Joe Morton who really gets into the heart of, you know, what this relationship between this white president and his black mistress may mean or how it may be for um, audiences. 
But this was after they de they developed a following for the show. You know, after they used social media to create this um, frenzy around the show. So I think it's a pattern that happens where people, um, writers especially, once they become more popular, once they become more successful, they may have more li license to create. Well, I would love to believe that. Um, I would love to believe that that Chandra, that Chandra Rhimes is um, already woke and that she is, you know, this is a part of a, a, a bigger plan. Um, <laughs> I know. But, but, and this is something we were discussing at dinner, you know, sort of the trajectory of Olivia in, in Scandal, it is really interesting. Um, and uh, Annalise as well, um, even though she has less to do with that. Mm -hmm. um, but it, with Olivia, it, it's like she is initially given agency and power and a sense of self that is incredibly strong in season one. Mm -hmm. And every season since that, <laughs> every season since that, more has been stripped from her. Um, and, and, and because of that, it, it sort of makes me wonder, um, it sort of makes me wonder, like, why? Why is that the choice? Why is, is this sort of disempowerment um, or going to the dark side? Uh, if you guys have seen this past week's episode, it has to do with a chair, not pretty. Um, and, and um, Olivia's definitely gone dark. There is no white hat in sight. Um, but I, I, I also think that it, it goes along with this idea of where you can go with characters of color. But again, it's sort of that accidental backing into tropes without when you're not putting them in enough of a larger, broader cultural context. Is, is a fascinating sort of study, a case study in, you know, them uh, with, with Shonda intentionally casting a woman of color for this part, you know, because it's based on the real life of Judy Smith, who's a black woman. Although, like, over the seasons, the relationship between Shonda and Judy Smith evaporates, and so, you know, thus the relationship with connecting Olivia and Judy Smith also sort of eva is evacuated. That relationship no longer really exists, or the tie between them no longer really exists. And I think, so casting her, like specifically a, a black woman, but then also recognizing that in order to sell this show to a mass audience, people who are gonna watch, you know, Thursday nights on ABC, you need to sell it to something that a mass audience read a white audience um, was gonna come to and watch. And so you can't have someone who's too much, right? Like the character, <coughs> like, like think about, you know, who Kerry Washington is and what Kerry Washington looks like and how Kerry Washington, you know, like has this sort of look that is acceptable to, to everybody. There's nothing about her that feels too black or doesn't feel black enough, right? Like, so there's something about her, her, her performance. Um, Bambi says she only has three, like, faces, and she does, it's true. Um, but, that, but, but there's something about her performance that sort of encapsulates something for everyone, and, or <clears throat> at least in theory. Whereas she can be written in this spirit of colorblindness where, again, it's not supposed to matter, you know, the racial piece until it, until it becomes meaningful or until she feels like, until Shonda at all feel like they can sort of incorporate it in, in some half-ass ways, really. Like the Sally Hemings thing where, where she, you know, is upset and she's like, I feel like you're Sally Hemings, you own me sort of thing. And it's, it's sort of this give moment and then takes it away back, takes it back because it's not actually a, a genuine conversation that they're having. It's about something else and this is just thrown up as the as the, the excuse for why they can't be together. So I think the way the colorblindness operates and co like the spirit of it even with Olivia Pope is, is meaningful. Thank you. Sorry for the loaded questions, but you guys did an amazing job. Um, so this question is directed towards Dr. Higgins and then we will again um, have 
the other speakers uh, touch on them again, uh, as well. So how would you describe Shonda Rhimes' trajectory of black female protagonists um, in Shondaland in relation to representations of race and gender? How does her use of a colorblind approach interact or influence these representations? And can we have critical, can we engage in critical analysis of racial relations in her shows? And can the public use her shows as discourse? <laughs> yeah. I know, very loaded, I know. <laughs> Pick and choose. Um, well, um, first off, I, I think that anytime you see representations uh, of black femininity that are different from the history of representation, meaning of the Beulah, the Mammy, or um, you know, the, the Pam Greer ripoff of Get Christy Love in the 70s, or the various iterations of Mama, whether it's Good Times or Give Me a Break or That's My Mama, that was literally Mama, um, it, I think whenever that, that kind of representation appears, there's something significant going on. Um, what I, and when we're talking about her protagonist, we're really talking about Olivia and kind of talking about, um, uh, about Annalise. And I, I, I just recently wrote this article about what I think is going on here. And, and I think part of it is that it, in our, our expectations of the protagonist in quality television has changed significantly. And that whereas once we could see a good guy at the center and accept that and say, oh, he's all good. It's like, you guys probably don't remember this show, but um, on ER, Mark Green, or um, I, I'm trying to think of somebody else who's just good. Um, like we find those characters kind of disinteresting today, or are disinterested in them, because there's no central moral conflict. And I think whether you're talking about Tony Soprano on The Sopranos, who is, you know, who is the, the mobster family man, or Walter White on Breaking Bad, who is the science teacher turned meth kingpin, um, we have this relationship with these, these characters that, um, Allow, affords a certain degree of identification, um, even when they're doing reprehensible things. And I think in many ways the same thing is, is what's going on with Olivia and Annalise. But because they are black women, there has to be a healthy side order of suffering in order for that, that kind of power and that kind of agency to be acceptable. I mean, um, Olivia's gone literally been kidnapped, been auctioned off, all of these things, um, and, and still is, you know, trying a relationship with Fitz, it doesn't work out, blah, 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 blah. Happily ever after, he's nowhere on, you know, nowhere on the screen. Oh yeah, and her dad was in charge of a secret black ops or organization and her mom was a terrorist, but she, she had thought she was dead. And then you have with, um, with Annalise, someone who suffered the loss of a child that you didn't know about, had been um, experimenting with her sexuality, which you didn't know about, has uh, definitely has a tie to a sort of down home upbringing in Memphis that you didn't know anything about. Oh, and her husband was killed and had knocked up uh, one of his his students, et cetera, et cetera. So, that, but but they can have all this agency. They can be all really powerful, but there has to be some suffering involved. And the last thing I would add, and I know I'm going a little bit over, is um, can you use this as discourse in the classroom and just with each other? And I think absolutely yes. Like the lawn chair episode of uh, the Ferguson-based episode of, um, of Scandal uh, was really interesting and was praised in many, many ways. Um, and I like to call it Olivia Makes Black Lives Matter. Um, because Olivia finally remembered she was black during this episode. And then everything that happens in the episode is undermined when she brings the father to Fitz, to the great white father, who affirms his pain. And I was just like, I literally sat looking at the screen going, no, why did you do that? 
Because it does, once again, just undermine this idea of, of a black character's agency not really existing unless it's affirmed by a white character. So I think I answered half of what you had. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Newman? Yes, um, we were talking about that episode earlier, and I was um, saying how as it was very powerful episode, I think, in terms of drawing attention to an issue um, that was actually getting a lot of attention everywhere else. And somehow in Shondaland, these things don't happen. Um, which is why I'm going to move there next week. Just um, but yeah, one of the things that it made me think about is how those types of narratives done in such a way can be extremely dangerous. Because uh, within theater, there's this guy called Augusto Boal who developed theater for the oppressed. Do I have any theater people in the room? Okay, okay, all right. Um, so Boal, who he basically he critiqued um, Aristotle's version of tragedy, which is you guys have heard of catharsis and how when you're watching a tragedy, there's this release where you purge all of these negative emotions. And what Boal had an issue with that. Um, because he said basically by watching those things, what happens to an audience is you purge those negative emotions through your catharsis of watching, but then you don't do anything. Mm -hmm. And so that's the danger of having a story like that where, you know, it shows up out of nowhere and it's resolved in such a way that, again, it reinforces what I um, in, in my work referred to as a master narrative, which it goes back to reinforcing um, just some of the same ideologies about whose lives, voices, and stories really matter. And so in that instance, um, I think Courtney B. Vance did a great job in nuancing that role. And I think um, it, it just was not, uh, the way that story was structured was not helpful for and to me, it's a perfect example of why the possibilities of Shondaland that I'm hoping will, you know, be in effect going forward. But it's not likely because of her own views on race and the way she's talked about it in her previous interviews. Thank you. And Dr. Uh, so three, three things. One, I think to speak to Monica's point earlier about Rhymes' sort of ascendancy of power at the network and how, how critical that is. I think it is only because she can do what she wants, it's only because she, is, she has brought in all these successful shows that she can do what she wants. She can hire who she wants, she can bring back from the dead who she wants. I mean, it's, I mean it's she, what can she do? And the answer is absolutely nothing. Whatever she wants is what she gets, at least at this current iteration of, of network uh, executive. So I think for her to be able to do that that lawn chair episode first is really impactful. Like it shows her power as uh, a network power as an ex a network powerhouse, and that's important. It's important to see that there is a black woman who can get what she wants uh, at, 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 on, in um, in the television industry because that is never like heard of. So I want to say that like that's the first part. The second part is one of the things that I sort of have a that I grapple with in my work and specifically specifically with Shonda and with her relationship with fans is that she does a whole lot, like there's a lot of labor that, has, that fans have to do to make sense of, of, her, uh, of her characters, to make sense of the storylines. And I would say that it's, it's interesting because that episode to me feels like fan fiction. Like what happens if Olivia goes to Ferguson? You know, what happens, does she, how can she fix it? How can she make, make, live, make black lives matter? Well, she goes, she, she uses her connect at the White House, and she gets a bill launched, and la da da. And we never see these characters again, right? It's the most self contained episode that I've seen in forever because she's able to sort of, Sean is able to wield this power to get this episode made, to do all these things that she wishes Olivia Pope could do and that she, by extension, can do. And, you know, all this great stuff happens, the end, right? We pick up, we, we might get Harrison too you know, into the next season. But outside of that, like, there's no, there's no, no continuation. She never goes back to that part of DC. We never see that part of DC again, and it doesn't matter. And I think that speaks to, like, that level of, 
of play that like she's able that she's not able to really to deal with. And so lastly, I would say that and where I sort of want to start moving toward is thinking about what labor Monica and Bambi and you all who watch these shows, how much labor y'all do to make sense of who these people are, to make sense of Olivia Pope as black woman, right? How much work do you have to do to pretend that she's laying on that pillowcase and her hair is not, like her hair it should be all curly and kinked up, is straight and silky? How, how much work do you have to do to pretend that when she gets in the shower and her hair is all curly, then when she gets out and it's straight, how much work do you have to do to make sense of that, right? And so that's what I, that's, that, so like that gets to the, not to the question of like, she's able to be this agent and that's great, but at the same time, what do you, what work do you have to do to make that meaningful? That's Thank you so much. If everyone can join me in giving them a hand. Uh, hand. I, once again, would like to thank you all for answering these loaded questions um, and joining us discussing Shonda and her weird, I don't know, success and everything. Um, so now we have a question and answer. So if anyone has a question uh, towards a specific, or we'll have all of our speakers address it. Um, if anyone wants to ask any questions, feel free to about anything. Um, Anything Shonda related, anything Grace media representation related? Yeah. Um, so I know Viola Davis in her acceptance speech said that the problem was that roles are not being written for people of color, particularly women of color, and she thought that was the reason we aren't being represented. Um, so do you think colorblind casting is a solution to that at this moment, if those roles are written, or is it an excuse to not write them at all? One. So colorblind casting only works. So colorblind casting becomes a solution if you if you evacuate every other part of the writing the, 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 of, a, of the production process. Namely, okay. So if you don't have people at the top, you don't have people of color at the top who will say, well, we should make shows for people. We should make shows. Of, you know, we should make shows about people of color, different people of color experiences or different people's experiences. If you don't have writers of color who were given opportunities to show run which is the bigger problem, then you probably won't see a lot of diversity in the cast. So I think it's, a, it's this loaded problem that, that is just, that, that is exacerbated by literally every other thing. So colorblind casting becomes a solution if you're only thinking of the place of acting, right? Or if you're only thinking of how can we get more look, different looking people on screen. And so if, you, if that's the case, and that's all you want to do, then that could be a solution, but it's shallow because again, you're not accounting for those people's backgrounds or experiences. Even if it's not an experience that they have had, if you, if you don't account for it or adjust for it, that person is very well walking into these old systemic tra tropes that they don't necessarily mean to. So it's why it's critical that you not only have a colorblind cast, but that you have a color, like if you colorblind cast, you have writers who can adjust for the colorblindness, that you have producers and showrunners who can think through what the logistics of that might be, that you have executives who are interested in not only seeing visual difference, but hearing visual difference, and, mm -hmm. and, ex and exploring different kinds of experiences that mass culture, we often sort of assume, it's, it's unfortunate because it assumes that white audiences are not interested in stories that aren't about things that they know. Whereas we, as people of color, are often expected to know, to, to, to of course, that, of course, normal, that's normal, of course that's an experience that we should know. So it's an interesting thing, so, but I think it sort of backs up to every uh, facet of, of production. And this is why I think education is really important. I think the ways in which a lot of people who are being trained to work in, this, in these areas, a lot of the examples that you're getting in classrooms, um, a lot of the projects that people are producing, <coughs> they are not geared towards learning how to think in that way. They're very often geared towards reinforcing the status quo. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, in film school, they'll show a film like B.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation as like, one of the most uh, groundbreaking first feature-length films, and somehow manage to talk about that film without talking about the racist elements within that film and how that ties into the cinematic language we've come to understand as audiences and as artists. So it's um, people who actually, like the mind has to be decolonized
to think in a different way in order for something like colorblind casting to work. Which is why within theater, we are more geared towards having a conversation now about color conscious casting, on how we can um, cast people in roles in ways that tell the other sides of, of, of a story, but also in producing more work by and about people of color. Because you can't just take Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman with an all-black cast. It's not going to give you the same uh, information that you would get from Lorraine Hansberry's A Raisin in the Sun. And they're both dealing with the American dream, but from two different sides of it. So we become a richer, um, richer artist and richer audiences when we understand that and explore that, rather than you know looking at it as now this is another problem we have to deal with. It's not a problem; it's a new opportunity we get to explore. I, I agree with what both of you have said, and I think that if there are examples of color-conscious casting on television. Um, they, a lot of them have, are, are associated with David Simon in some way, whether we're talking about Homicide Life on the Streets or The Wire or Treme. Um, and these are shows that specifically are casting, it, where the stories are written about, based upon people they know, uh, people they know, people who existed. Um, people who, who actually have a whole, a three-dimensional life. And we may only see them for a little while, but we know how they fit within this community and within this larger story. But it takes a sensitivity to what is, what story you're trying to tell, or what, more honestly, what stories you're trying to tell. Because, and, and usually, interestingly enough, they're, they're usually site-based. Um, in both The Wire and in, in Homicide Life in the Streets, it's about Baltimore. And Baltimore is this interesting, not quite north, not quite south space. And so their issues of race, is, issues of history, issues of economics, all uh, issues of immigration all play together in really strong ways within the context of these sometimes Baroque narratives. There's a lot going on. Um, and, and I think that's it, that was definitely true in The Wire. I, I'm, I'm a bigger fan of Homicide Life on the Streets, actually, because I feel like it is a more intimate show. And if you've never watched it, watch it. It is a phenomenal show. Um, and, and, it, it, and I think uh, Treme does some of the same things, uh, gets a little bit closer to homicide in terms of the intimacy, in terms of not being so widespread. Um, but I, I think, and I think this goes on, goes beyond, um, you know, it goes beyond just some of the issues that we're talking about here. I've had a student say in, you know, a screenwriting class, um, wrote, um, George, uh, a white man in his 20s, and Sarah, a black woman in her 20s, and had the, the professor say, oh, you don't need to say he's white. Now that kind of embedded normativity is what's giving messages to people who are the next generation of media makers. That says something about the value of your story. And, and I think that's problematic. And I think that there needs to be more, just like we want to raise the consciousness of, uh, uh, you know, of our students, of those of us who, who hear us speak or who read our work, sometimes I feel like we need to be starting in the faculty meetings and make sure that people are aware of the ways in which they are pigeonholing, um, pigeonholing characters you know, and, and that doesn't even deal with who gets to hand, have, hold the camera, who gets to direct, who gets to be, um, who gets to be a cinematographer. You know, those are all issues that, as Kristen said, it's on every level of production. That, and all of those things work together to shape a world with different kinds of visions versus one that keeps recirculating the same story.
You know, people talk all the time about, oh, they just seem to be, you know, doing remakes and, and doing superhero movies and doing, it, there are a lot of stories out there that can't get made. Just to sort of piggyback on that, so um, I don't know if you are if any of you watched the 100 or are following sort of the the the, the kerfuffle regarding the, the executive producer sort of gay baiting an audience and then you know fridging the one of the big relationships on the show and then claiming that he did he wasn't aware that you know gay characters dying was a trope that, that was then unfounded. So one of the things that was interesting out of that conversation is, well, if there's a fear, well, you know, will will showrunners, will white showrunners stop, you know, writing stories about people who are not different, who are different from them, out of fear that they'll get it wrong, right? Like this becomes the question. Well, you know, will we stunt diversity altogether if we don't, you know, if 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 we don't give these folks some grace? Now, here's my, my response: is is quite simple. The assumption is that the only people who can be showrunners, again, are white males, right? Cis, white, straight males. As opposed to, what is the problem? Why don't we ponder why there are no people of color? Why there are no people of color who may also be LGBTQ, right? Like, why we, are, why we assume that these folks are, are not allowed in the showrunner position, right? Where they can think about these issues. Why are we um, relying and depending on the same folks to entrusting and trusting them to have to tell the story right. Now, this is not to say that they don't have that responsibility, nor should they have it, right? If you're gonna tell the story, tell the story right. Think about your decisions. That's one of the big things. Let's not assume that everyone is equal. Let's not assume that death is always equal. Yes, people die on TV shows. That is one of the things that happen. But you also have to think about who you're killing and what the historical ramifications of that are, because that is meaningful, mm -hmm. right? So, be so you need to be responsible and, and Read a book every now and again, right? <laughs> this is crucial. Read a book, watch some movies, you know, follow some things and, and, and track that. But that is but, so that's one part. But I think it's also crucial that we start to, to sort of inquire what it takes, you know, to actually be a showrunner, to actually sort of decide, you know, what kind of stories need to get told. That there are hundreds of stories that have not been we've not seen, that we don't know. There are hundreds of cases of people and characters and situations and experiences that we are um, not allowed to, to share, to watch, because those folks who can tell those stories are not allowed in the room. And so rather than continuing to have this conversation about, oh, the poor white man, because he can't, what happens if he gets it wrong? Well, he might get it wrong, but you know who might get it right if he, what, or how he might get it right if he had some people of color in the room, some gay writers in the room. Like, what would happen? How different would his show be? How much thoughtful, much more thoughtful would he be? Or could he be, right, if that were the case? Flip that, if you are a person of color in the room and you're the only one, you're probably not gonna say anything because you wanna keep your job. And employment is a reality that we also have to take into account, right? Like, so from the place of acting where, you know, um, if you, if this is your one job, this is your one shot, who's going to ruin that by saying, well, you know what, I just don't think that that's responsible because as a black person, I don't know if I want to, no one's going to say that because you want to work. And if you're not playing a drug addict or a slave or, you know, a thief or a gangster, and you're just playing a, a doctor who, you know, is completely sort of absent of the history of the super spade or whatever, that's not a big deal. We can live with that. Or you know, like if, like so you so you might be able, you might make a decision if you're the one writer in the room of color, then you might have to make a decision as to what you're going to say and what you're not going to say because chances are they probably think you're a quota person anyhow. So everything that you do is mat is it will matter in terms of what your future looks like. So you know, thinking about what diversity means to some degree, diversity for a lot of people is purely visual and that is acceptable. And sometimes you if, to keep your job. That might be all that you might want to do, right? We just want to get to look different. And that might be the, as far as you think you can go. The question becomes then, how do you move that, how do you you know, push that ball on further along? And it's going to take, honestly, things that we don't have, which you know, include you know, representation at the, level, at the top, at the highest levels, with people who have some measure of consciousness. Now, they also have to recognize the bottom line. But the bottom line is always recognized. I mean, black folks go see anything with black people in it because we so few, we so rarely get to be on TVs like anything. We'll watch. If you put us in front of, if you put some folks that look like us in front of it, that is, you know, statistics. Like that, that's proven, that's, that bears out in data. 
So it's not that you wouldn't have those as consumers, but you sort of have to change the ways that people of color are addressed in, in, in advertising. For example, we're dirty demos. Like, it does not matter you know, how many of us have spending power. It does not matter how many of us will buy Ethan Allen furniture. It does not matter. If you assume that all we will buy are like this malt, malt liquor and McDonald's and Ford, you know, then that's what your demographic is going to be limited to. As opposed to, you know, consumers, the same sort of consumers that they desire for other things. And so, so, it, so there's got to be some systemic changes across the board in order to get to that place. And that's often why I'm such a fabulous. <laughs> folks who are still 
working, you know, to put their stuff out there. But that's the nature of the business on some level. It, it, it's, it's about creating your own narratives, you know, and, and finding ways, whether it's, you know, um, finding alternative uh, theater spaces to perform a play, whether it's doing stand-up in a coffee house, whether it, it, it's filming your own web series and, and, and putting it up on, on YouTube. Those are all ways that you can put your stuff out there. Because part of it is visibility. There are probably other people who would, who would engage with and identify with on what the story you're trying to tell. But if you never tell it, if you never put it out there, there's not the opportunity to find that audience. And there just isn't, like the way network television is structured today in particular, and, and, and I, you know, film is a whole other thing, but the way network television is constructed is you, you do not have time to build an audience. That just, it, that, that isn't the way it works anymore. Um, so having an audience, having a following, um, it, it is really integrally important. You know, we could talk next spring about how Insecure did when it, when it finally made it on air. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, but, but I just see her as such an important, shining example of someone who said there was, no, you know, she was told there's not really a place for you at the table, so I'm going to build my own table and I'm going to put stuff on it. Okay, that's the first part of the question. The second part of the, the question is speak up. When somebody, you know, seriously, when you feel as though you are being silenced in class, um, or if something's being done that it in some way is diminishing your ability to get what you need to get out of a class, um, there's, uh, there's the ombudsman, there's the chair of the department, there's, um, you know, there are ways to communicate that this isn't okay. And, and I know that sounds scary. I, I know that sounds scary. But talking to other people, making sure that this is, that you're not alone in this experience can often create an opportunity for people to visit the chair rather than person. It, or for people to talk to uh, the ombudsman. You know, it, it, it's, I don't think change happens unless it's demanded. I, I don't think that people are going to get out of their comfort zone, for the most part, out of the goodness of their heart. I think that happens with pressure. And, and I think, you know, I think that that pressure can come in a number of ways. But I think that the pressure has to, there has to be some pressure created in order for, for people to acknowledge um, that there is an issue. And you can find allies among the faculty to help give you guidance on this as well. So that's, you know, it, as difficult as I think that is, I, I think it, it's important when someone is not acting right that they get called out. And if you can't, if you have to find a way of of being able to let someone know, whether it's another faculty member, whether it's an advisor, whether it's, you know, there has to be a way to, there has to be a way to create, um, to create a paper trail, to create a history of, of this kind of, these kind of incidents or this kind of misconduct um, in order for it to have some result. Anyone else want to jump in that question? Uh, I would, to the first point that uh, Bambi made, I would say 
one of the one of the things to to, to remember um, is you know um, is to to be one of the things that I try and, and, and uh, have my students sort of immerse them in in my I teach a race and gender class and it's sort of an industry course where we sort of just look at numbers for weeks on end and it becomes very depressing because like the realities are that people of color in particular women of color are just underrepresented at every at every level and so to just sort of recognize what that means right like the opportunities have to sort of like the the, the universe has to align almost perfectly in television uh, at least and in, and in film for there to be for you to sort of get through that door and 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 the door is you know like a, a steel fortress right so like you're sort of having to do some Mission Impossible kind of stuff to, to negotiate your ways around and, and have the relationship with people who can help you get through the door, help you sort of, uh, or not get through, but sort of navigate your way around it. And so that part is crucial, to sort of just be aware of the, 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 the data that suggests, that, that tells you sort of what's happening from year to year. That's the first thing. It's, da it's a downer, but, it, but it's helpful to sort of recognize what barriers are, are in front of you so that you can make decisions as to how you want to proceed, right? So that you're not going in, you know, uh, assuming something about your, like, assuming that it's your skill set alone that's going to get you through the door. The skill set is important. Um, the skill set is crucial, but you also have to have all these other factors in line as well. And I, and I think that that helps. Issa Rae, I love Issa, and God bless Insecure. But that there is a New York Times profile on her that was so um, uh, interesting. Yeah, because what she was talking about was the experience that she had going from uh, Misadventures of Awkward Black Girl to the show that she was in development with with Shonda Rhimes that for some reason didn't work out and that Issa Rae will never speak about explicitly. So, you know, there's that. To the point where she got to the HBO net, to the HBO show where she was working with Wilmore and then Wilmore split to go do the nightly show. So now, and so the show was sort of in limbo for a while and then someone came in to executive produce and like, it was like the crowd of black executives, the black folks who are in industry, that who have some measure of leverage, all sort of circled around her. The, the fact that HBO wrote, you know, like there was lots of rules HBO had for her in terms of who she could hire, in terms of her staff, that they were looking for people who had writing credits, even though Lena Dunham's people did not have writing credits when they started on Girls. So there were lots of things that went sideways um, with the development of the show that ended up becoming Insecure. Even the fact that she can't claim an executive producer credit on her own damn show, right? So, like, there are lots of things that are great about the possibility that she's that we will finally have a black lead on an HBO show. That finally HBO will do one. It will give us one after 15 years of zero, right? That, like, so it's great. It's wonderful. And yet, when you count the cost of how she got from Misadventures, where she did develop a web presence. And she did develop a following. These people paid, like, gave fifty thousand dollars in the Kickstarter so she can buy equipment to make season two. Like, there is a commitment, and people put money behind it. That that still isn't enough to mobilize her in the same ways that if Lena Dunham has Judd Apatow as her patron saint, she can get girls, no problem, right? There is, there, there are, like, we need to sort of account for the stories, read these stories, and know how these people get to where they get to, and not necessarily the the hype pieces that they give about themselves, but read and follow along and track who gets what and how they got there. Because if you can track that, then there is a, that, that narrative will tell you how they made it and it will tell you what your odds are, what you need in order to get there. So Wilmore helped Issa get through the door. Issa alone couldn't make it with HBO. Issa alone, without the, accept, with the, the help of her black executive producer person, couldn't you know, get the contacts that she needs to fight against HBO and their writer policy, which she eventually sort of got, and she got some of her people in and some couldn't. There are lots of stories here that are important if you are interested in going into this field or going into this industry, and you need to be prepared and armed with that, with that understanding. Because otherwise, you'll, you'll continue to think as you, right? Like, you'll continue to think, well, it must be I'm not good enough or I'm not smart enough. Please understand that most people who started off in the business started off as PAs they got through internships because they were affiliated with a college where there's somebody who, who went to their college as an alumni who has a connection. These people were sending out FedEx mailers and going to the UPS store and sending, you know, 
This is what their jobs were. And then they got moved to the writer's room where they got to dictate and you know, do dictation um, and, and take notes. And then they got an opportunity to break a story. And these women are white. All right? So you have to follow the story in order to see how these people get to where they get to. That they, these people don't have film degrees. They don't know how to write a screenplay. These were math majors, history majors, French majors, not people who have an interest or an investment in film and television. So you, also, you have to follow these narratives because that will tell you how you can get from A to B or how you might have to, how the struggle from A to B might be a little bit more difficult than you initially um, imagined. I would just add one thing really quickly in case other people have questions. Yeah. Just to say that this is one of the reasons why I advocate for working outside of the system. Like just finding finding a whole other way to do the work because this system is corrupt. Um, it needs to be restructured in order for it to be any equality. And that's why I think it's the diversity discussion is less productive than an inclusion. Um, to talk more about inclusion and equality. And within the system as it is, it's not happening. It's easier to talk about diversity where we have the superficial change rather than making any actual structural changes. So I think it's important for people to, you know, rather than having your dream be pick, having your show picked up by something like HBO is probably going to destroy it anyway. Uh, trying to figure out how to build a system that works that we don't have to use. We have the technology now to do things that we could not have done even 20 years ago in terms of reaching audiences, not just in the U.S., but all around the world. I think we need to think more about how to use the infrastructure that exists and build new infrastructure to uh, be able to circulate these narratives and, and these works. So, uh, if we can just have more imagination in that regard rather than necessarily just trying to work within the industry. Because it's, it's, it's a mess. Thank you so much. Um, we'll just have one more question and um, then we'll end it up after that. Um, I know you talked like extensively about like people who are in the industry and how they can like initiate change, but like for someone who is probably never going to be in the industry, like how as like how can we as consumers like demand change like can we at all or like how can we actively like try to like um like not further exacerbate any of these issues but like instead try to help them or is there any way possible support work by and about people of color support the work that is uh, more representative of the type of world that you want to see represented as opposed to um, okay, so Batman and Super versus Superman, right? It just came out. Sure, people want to see that, but when you go see those things, you're voting for those things. Every every time you spend a dollar on a particular thing, every time you click on a particular link, um, every time you follow those things, then you are sending a message that those are things that you are interested in and that you want to support. So you have to go out, you know, out of the usual circles to find some of this um, material. But those are things that I think we need to follow um, to support and to, to and to try to create. Not to say that you can't see Batman versus Superman. Some people wanted to see it, which is fine. But just recognizing that the more we support those types of things, the more those types of things are going to be. Reproduce. Like if I have to, if I have to hear about another freaking sequel, mm -hmm. another remake, another revival, another. It's like, really, do we have to keep going back and recirculating all of the same old things when we have so many people on the planet with all these interesting cultures and stories that we could be drawing from? So I think we have to look more for those um, for those types of. <laughs> business is not neutral. Um, business is, char is, is ideologically charged, and the people who make decisions um, are not making decisions necessarily based on public uh, interest, but oftentimes based on what they want to see. 
Um, Universal Studios had a great year last year. They decided to target different demographics. They decided to like infuse each of their, at each quarter, they had a, a, a film that was designated for a different demographic, right? So they had Fifty Shades of Grey, which was targeted to women. They had Straight Outta Compton, which was targeted largely to people of color, but also could be sold as a, 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 a mass audience film. They had uh, Fast and Furious 7, which has the multicultural cast, which, you know, all the data suggests people want to see cast that are multiracial. Great. Um, and then they had Jurassic World, which was, again, like, science fiction for everybody, right? Everybody likes dinosaurs, all right? So you have, <laughs> so you have different demographics, right? Each of these films overperformed, right? Um, Fifty Shades was made for $40 million. All female crew, director, writer, right? Exec like the executive producer that the story is based on. Um, all women. $40 million budget, $500 million worldwide. Straight out of Compton, $20 million budget, $150, $180 million worldwide. Fast and Furious 7, $150, $200, $200 million budget, $800 million worldwide. Jurassic Park, Jurassic World, who cares, right? Like money, <laughs> right? Billions of dollars, right? So Universal was in the black. Universal had the best year it had in a long time based on that strategy. And yet, no studio is reproducing that strategy, right? No studio says, look at what they did over there. We could do that over here. Like, people are putting their money where their mouth is. They're saying, I want to see more movies about women. Even if it's Fifty Shades of Grey, even if I don't like it, I'm going to go see it on opening night to go laugh or something, <laughs> right? Like, I'm going to go, right? Had biggest pre-sale tickets in years. Like, people in the South going to see Fifty Shades of Grey, right? Huge opening, huge. Yet, yeah, no one is reproducing that. No one is saying, let's target more, let's make more movies that target women, specifically. No one is saying, let's make more movies that target black folks, specifically. If we do it, we might make some money. Or no one is saying, let's do more multiracial casts. So I, I, so I say that to say, it's not just that, putting your money where your mouth is and supporting, although I think it is crucial that that happens, that you go out of your ways and see things that you wouldn't normally see, and then sort of increase your own understanding as a consumer of, what kinds of work is available. But I think also recognizing that at the end of the day, business operates the way that it wants to. And if as long as you have people in charge who assume that black folks only want this or that women only want that or that they'll go see whatever and we just need to fill the seats because who our main demographics are are 18 to 35 year old white men. As long as you have that understanding, the people in charge are, are, are reinforcing that, you're gonna to continue to have this Batman versus Superman and Iron Man 22, where you have like $300 million of marketing toward a movie that you know good damn well is coming out, right? So, you, so, and so I think there are lots of different factors for why um, it's hard and, and why I think agency as a consumer is limited. But I certainly do believe it's, it's <coughs> possible in, in some small degrees. But this is exactly why I said you, we need a new system. Mm. Because this one is broken because you can't get out of that right. paradigm the right. way that it exists. So we have to find another way because it's not going to change because the ideology is the same that it was in 1915. Yeah. Just really quickly, um, as a consumer, you can support local theater, support local performance. Um, when people are doing independent film festivals, you can go. Um, and, you know, <coughs> there's this fabulous thing called social media, heard of it? Um, you can tweet your displeasure. You can, you can, you can let, if something, you see something that you think is really screwed up, tweet ABC. Tweet ABC. You know, and because if that gets retweeted, um, there there's a way for that that message to spread. Um, and and if you know, just going back to the Batman versus Superman thing, which I haven't seen Batman versus Superman. I must admit, I'm a little bit of an Avengers geek, but. Um, but I, I, you know, I think we have to look beyond the big letters on 
you know, on the listing. You know, the big, the, the thing that they're trying to sell us the most. That there are small movies with limited releases that are saying some wonderful things. And those are few and far between. But, you know, and, and I think there's, and I haven't seen it yet. I don't know if either of you have, have seen Birth of a Nation. Oh, no. The, 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 the film that took Sundance by storm and is, um, you know, is a, a telling of Nat Turner's story, and it's called Birth of a Nation, very specifically reappropriating that um, that title. Um, go see that. You know, go see films that that are are at least trying to consciously engage some things. You don't need to say to see Taken 15. Liam Neeson survives. <laughs> Um, but 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 I think it, it takes work on your part, and, and I, I think if you want to feel like you're contributing to a more conscious media landscape, then participate in a more conscious media landscape. All right, thank you so much to our speakers and to the audience.